for men who have been rescued from shipwreck, there will always be the memory of the ordeal through which they passed. But they will also look back with gratitude to the men who challenged the sea's fury and who came to their aid regardless of their own safety, to the men of the lifeboat service to whom this film is dedicated. Early in the morning of 3rd January 1964, the Ben Barvis left her home port of Aberdeen en route for the Icelandic fishing grounds. The Ben Barvis was a comparatively new ship, a diesel trawler of some 300 tons, capable of a speed of 11 knots and in first class condition. Her route lay northwards, roughly parallel to the coast towards Buchan Ness and Rattray Head, and then across the open waters of the Murray Firth in a general northwesterly direction and at the entrance to the Pentland Firth. The Pentland Firth lies between the Orkney Isles to the north and the northern mainland of Scotland, and it is the main shipping route round the north of Britain. Firth average is about eight miles in width, and the coasts on either side are rocky and precipitous, forming a narrow channel through which the sea continually ebbs and flows from the North Sea to the Atlantic. The tides are strong and fast, and the rocky islands, although picturesque in themselves, interrupt the flow of the sea, causing numerous currents and eddies with powerful tide races and dangerous tide rips during bad weather, and these give rise to confused surging seas and broken water. Across the eastern end of the Firth lies a small group of islands, the Pentland Skerries, a notorious hazard and the graveyard of many fine ships. And when the weather deteriorates, and the combined effect of strong tides and high winds makes the Firth dangerous for shipping, heavy breaking and surging seas sweep over the jagged reefs of the Skerries with tremendous force. At the southern end of the island of Hoy lies the farming and fishing community of Longhope with its important lifeboat station. The community is scattered, part of it lying along Longhope to the north and being connected by a causeway to the district of Brims to the south. Most of the lifeboat crew live in Brims and it is here on sheltered Ape Hope that there has been a lifeboat station for 90 years. The station is only a few minutes sailing from the Pentland Firth. Through the years, in storms and heavy seas, ships of many nations have had good reason to thank the lifeboat service. The weather was not bad when the Ben Barvis left her home port, but the shipping forecast from the coast radio station indicated deteriorating weather conditions in the north of Scotland later in the day, with winds rising to gale force. This meant dangerous conditions in the Pentland Firth, with strong tides backed by rising winds, and then heavy surf and breakers along the coast, on the islands, and over the reefs. The trawler's skipper and his crew of 13 were competent and experienced seamen. They had done the trip many times before, and there can have been little thought of possible disaster as the ship approached the firth, well south of the Skerries. And so, approaching the firth, the ship came under the combined influence of the strong tides and rising winds, with their insidious effects on navigation. Ben Barvis continued on her general northwesterly course, with Pentland Skerries ahead on her starboard bow. The Skerries arise from a shallow plateau of rock, with the larger Muckle Skerry to the north, and the low-lying Lowther, Kletach and Little Skerries to the south, and with a connecting chain of deadly submerged reefs. The Ben Barvis was a powerful ship, used to bad weather going to and from the fishing grounds, 
and the stronger tides in the firth at first appeared to cause her little trouble. But the heavy surf was now breaking over the low-lying reefs as the trawler ploughed on through rising seas. Her intended route would have taken her well south of the Skerries, but the effect of the powerful tide and strong winds acting on her since she approached the Firth had driven her slowly off course towards the Skerries. And the continuing surge in the Firth with the power of the Atlantic behind it drove the trawler further off course until the Skerries lay dead ahead. In heavy seas, Low islands and reefs are not easy to see, often until it is too late. And the momentum of a 300-ton ship at full speed is too great to turn quickly against the combined force of sea and wind. And so, late in the day, the Ben Barber surged relentlessly on, defied all efforts to turn her before disaster, and with a rending crash, struck the little skerry and heeled over. Kirkwall Coast Guard picked up the distress call. The Coast Guard informed the Honorary Secretary at Longhope, who then requested the Coast Guard to inform the casualty that the Longhope lifeboat would launch immediately and to obtain a bearing of the wreck from the Muckleskerry Lighthouse. A check by Decker Navigator placed her near the south end of the Little Skerry. At Long Hope, two maroons were fired, a time-tested procedure to summon the lifeboat crew. From their homes scattered along the shore, the crew answered the call. Within minutes of the firing of the maroons, on foot and by car, they were arriving at the boathouse. In any lifeboat call, speed is essential and at all lifeboat stations, everything is geared for a quick muster of the crew and launch of the lifeboat. Inside the boathouse, everything is always ready. The oil skins, life jackets, and sea boots. And the lifeboat facing the sea and ready to launch. And within 10 minutes of the Coast Guard's call, the Long Hope lifeboat was on her way to the wrecked Ben Barbas. Down sheltered Eighth Hope and out into the Pentland Firth. The southerly wind was rising and there was a heavy southerly swell. Excellent radio contact was maintained with Kirkwall Coast Guard and messages were exchanged with Ben Barvis giving the lifeboat's expected time of arrival. The lifeboat carried the stream flood tide with her making over 11 knots. She cleared the rough waters of the top of Swona and sailed to the east towards the Skerries. The tide was now setting to the southeast at about eight knots and with the rising wind from the southwest, the southerly seas were getting very steep. The approach to the wreck was not going to be easy. By radio, the lifeboat heard that a rubber life raft with five men aboard had broken adrift and been swept away from the trawler, leaving nine men on board. As the lifeboat approached the little skerry, the wreck could be seen lying bows to the west and broadside to the shore, and heeled over to 40 degrees. She appeared in imminent danger of capsizing as she was pounded by the heavy seas. The mechanics throttled back to half speed and the lifeboat eased close into the rocks to assess the position. Tidal eddies and confused breaking seas made conditions very dangerous. The lifeboat closed the wreck and hove to only 20 yards to windward, preparing to go alongside. And then, a huge wave came up astern, lifted the lifeboat and swept her broadside towards the wreck at tremendous speed. The cox ordered full astern, and from only a few feet from the wreck, the lifeboat clawed off stern first into the seas. 
Only the excellent design of the lifeboat and the expert handling by her crew prevented her from being thrown onto the wreck. The 30-foot high wave rolled 10 foot deep over the Ben Barbas's rails. The coxswain immediately decided that it was impossible to get alongside and that the surf boy must be used instead. The lifeboat hauled off upwind and across the tide as thick, heavy clouds reduced visibility and it became very dark. About 250 yards to windward, the anchor was dropped to veer the lifeboat down towards the wreck with the wind and the tide. When some 30 yards from the wreck, the cable was secured and the lifeboat lay stern towards the wreck with the wind on her starboard bow and the tide on her beam, tending to sweep her away from the wreck. The cox decided to rig a nylon line to the wreck to hold the lifeboat against the tide and keep her off the southeast reef, as shown in this model. With the anchor in position, a rocket line was fired across the trawler and a nylon rope or warp passed over and made fast to her upper deck aft. The lifeboat rolled and pitched as the second coxswain fired the line to the wreck. The coxswain mechanics endeavoured to keep the lifeboat in position as visibility varied continually with the passing squalls and clouds. A second nylon line was joined on to give sufficient slack and then, by means of the engines and capstan, the lifeboat was held in the best position. A second rocket was then fired, as shown in the model, for a pulley block to be passed over and secured and the surf buoy then to be rigged. The second line was successfully fired and drawn over to the wreck. The scrambling nets were rigged amidships. The pulley block and surf buoy lines were quickly secured to the light line and drawn over to the trawler and secured, following instructions over the lifeboat's loud hailer. While the surf boy was being prepared for passing to the wreck, the nylon warp from the lifeboat to wreck stranded and nearly parted and had to be re-secured. A difficult job with cold wet ropes, a heaving deck and seas continually breaking over the lifeboat, but speed was essential, for seas were breaking right over the Ben Barbas and her hatches, well battened down, had now been forced off. With her heavy list to port, the trawler's rails were sometimes above the sea and sometimes ten foot under the waves. The Ben Barbas position was now serious indeed, and her crew could not last much longer. To pull a man through heavy seas is exhausting and dangerous, and the nine men to be rescued would have to be pulled against the tide which would carry them after the lifeboat before they could be pulled in amidships and taken on board. But the lives of the nine men depended on the flimsy surf boy and its single rope. And here, as he is pulled through the swirling water, the survivor is helpless. He can only hang grimly onto the surf boy, hoping that his numbed fingers will keep their grip. He catches glimpses of the heaving lifeboat as he gasps and plunges up and down in the sea. On the lifeboat, two of the crew manned the outhaul for it. Second coxswain and another member of the crew on the in-haul amidships. Another member tended the cable and warp. The mechanics were on the controls and radio, and the cox on the helm and in command. The survivors were drawn into the lee of the lifeboat amidships, pulled aboard, and passed into the after cabin. It was heavy work for the lifeboatmen, pulling the survivors through the heavy sea against the strong tide. A job that could not be hurried, a job requiring skill and patience and strength. And for the survivors, battling for breath in the surf, hope and confidence. People ashore listened anxiously for news on their shortwave receivers. After the second survivor had been taken off, the trawler's fuel tanks ruptured and evil smelling diesel oil poured out, making deck and ropes extremely slippery and the task of drawing in the surf boy even more difficult. The 
the scrambling nets were of the greatest assistance in preventing the men from being drawn under the lifeboat. Only 60 feet of murderous sea and surf separated the survivors from safety, but the Ben Barbas was settling by the head, and the lifeboat crew worked desperately as they feared that the wreck might roll over at any time. In the heavy swell, one of the survivors fell down behind the trawler's rail, and a second attempt was made before he was drawn off again on the next wave. And the coxswain was constantly worried lest his anchor should lose its grip or the nylon warp should break. But careful handling of the engines and the capstan eased the strain. The last man to come off was the skipper, and as he left the wreck, he was pounded by heavy seas and two of his ribs were broken. But although in great pain, he managed to hold on to the surf boy. And finally, the skipper was drawn onto the lifeboat. It had taken a full hour to get the survivors off, but another great battle with the sea had been won. And as the lifeboat sent her report to the Coast Guard, the good news was heard in dozens of homes ashore. Thick clouds added to the gathering darkness as the wharf was cut and the lifeboat swung clear. The whole crew had shown exceptionally fine seamanship, for not once during the whole operation had the lines of the surf boy fouled, and the expert handling of the engines had kept the lifeboat in steady position against the racing tide between the reefs. But getting a lifeboat away from a wreck can be as dangerous as getting her in alongside, and continued vigilance was necessary as the cable was drawn in and the engines used to trip out the anchor to prevent the lifeboat from being caught broadside on by successive heavy seas and capsized. With the anchor finally secured, and the deck cleared of ropes, the lifeboat made contact with another trawler, the Ben Screel, which, by good fortune, had picked up the five men in the drifting life raft. These two were transferred to the lifeboat. Hot drinks were provided from the emergency stores, and without a doubt, these, and the warmth of the cabin heater, greatly helped in the survival of the shipwrecked men, for all were ill from swallowing diesel oil and suffering from shock and exposure. And so, through heavy seas, the lifeboat sailed home, having added nine more lives to the total of over 550 lives saved by the Long Hope Lifeboat Station. Her crew had carried out a magnificent service a service which won for each member of the crew the thanks of the lifeboat institution inscribed on vellum and for coxswain Dan Kirkpatrick, the second silver medal for gallantry.